Colleagues, we uh, start again, and uh, as I said uh, at the beginning of our this afternoon meeting, uh, we have today the pleasure and honor to have with us Commissioner Han, Johannes Han, our Commissioner for Budget and Administration, and uh, uh, I'm uh, very happy and would like to welcome him for joining us today for a structured dialogue focused uh, in particular on, on Interoperable Europe Act. We just discussed the draft report of uh, Mr. Ijabs. Uh, the last time we welcomed Commissioner Hani Nitre, we had a discussion on the cybersecurity regulation for the institutions, bodies, offices, and agencies of the Union, which is now is in, inter in, in interinstitutional uh, negotiation phase. ITRE has also adopted recently its opinion on the regulation for the information security at the EU institution. So uh, it's a clear trend to see more files under the remit of Commissioner Han uh, in our committee. So beside uh, clearly Commissioner Kaji Simpson, Energy, Maria Gabriel, Research, uh, Thierry Breton, Space, Defense, uh, Industry, and clearly Mrs. Vestager, mainly digitalization, we are very happy to be in uh, a good uh, uh, and cooperation relation with Commissioner Han on uh, such uh, interesting and important issues. I go now to Commissioner Han for his uh, initial interventions. Then uh, we have some interventions on behalf of the political uh, groups. And uh, at the end, the uh, Commissioner will uh, respond to that and maybe have some final conclusions. Mr. Commissioner, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to present and discuss with you the Interoperable Europe Act uh, proposal. First, I would like to explain and to excuse my delay, but I was uh, stuck in the Budget Committee. Uh, today, I feel almost like an MEP because it's my fourth appearance in the Parliament today. <laughs> and we had a discussion about uh, Next Generation EU and uh, the surge of interest rates uh, um, um, related to it. So. Uh, excuse once again, uh, but now I am pleased and, and really happy to talk to be here and to talk about the Act as we celebrate the 30th uh, anniversary of the Europe's single market and interoperability is essential for ensuring uh, the four freedoms of the European Union, uh, meanwhile in the digital era. The demand for cross-border digital public services is increasing. For citizens, cross-border digital services facilitate living, studying, and working in other European countries while having uh, access to digital public services regardless of geographic uh, location. We have uh, started this uh, initiative already, uh, I think, two years ago during the Portuguese presidency when we, in um, accordance and under the leadership of the Portuguese colleagues uh, for the first time after uh, eight years convened a meeting with uh, the administrative and IT responsible members of the uh, member states' governments in exactly to, to launch such a debate and such an initiative. Because uh, cross-border public services can and will significantly reduce the burden for businesses who deal with different administrative systems of EU member states, but the same applies, of course, also for citizens. So, for instance, let's take taxes as an example. Imagine a pre-filed electronic tax declaration service uh, connected with the registry of population, land registry, and business registry. A tax declaration validated uh, with a few clicks. This is what interoperability is about. Uh, so, last December, we committed to working together towards uh, the ambitious target of the digital decade, included 100% online accessible key public services in the Union by 2030. At the same time, Member States are investing heavily in the public sector's reform and the digital transformation. <clears throat> if you look at the combined investment plan, so the National Recovery and Resilient Plan, it amounts to 47 billion euro. This is an unprecedented uh, opportunity for change. We have a choice. Having all these services developed in national or sectorial silos or in an integrated way. 
allowing also cross-border data exchange. Only a fraction of public uh, uh, digital services offered by member states, local authorities and regions is available for cross-border use. This is why the Commission proposed the Interoperable Europe Act to help the EU and member states to deliver seamless key public services to citizens and businesses. This is not intervening in the sovereignty of member states. This is not mm -hmm. affecting the principle of subsidiarity. It's simply the reaction of uh, citizens and companies' um, daily life, uh, not respecting in a good way um, borders. And this is why I think there is a growing need for having this kind of interoperability. And uh, I'm saying this, and I want to stress it again, because uh, I think we should never lose sight of who we are working for, and this is for our people. I know that this is close to your hearts, too. Uh, the Interoperable Europe Act aims to set up a structured cooperation framework on cross-border interoperability between member states, public administrations, and EU institutions. In Europe, there will always be multiple IT systems at various levels, EU, national, regional, and local. We cannot and don't want to change that. We need to connect them. For this, we must work on common interoperability solutions that can be easily reused and connected. It's not only about, uh, so to say, hardware, IT tools, technologies. It's also about finding the proper legal setting how this can be done and um, uh, secured. So we should uh, share and reuse such solutions as much as possible. But supporting reuse alone is not enough. There's a lack of awareness of the structural importance of interoperability in the design and implementation of digital policies. There's also a lack of awareness about existing interoperability solutions and their benefits especially in the non-IT world. This is why the Act introduces interoperability assessments to help us to detect early on any barriers to cross-border interoperability. Doing this early when introducing a digital public service paves the way for a smoother implementation at a lower cost. We also need to encourage innovation and how digital services uh, could make use of innovative technologies. New technologies have huge potential to bring personalized public services to the next level. Experimentations are particularly important to learn about emerging technologies and their use in the public sector. All of this, of course, has to happen in full respect of data protection and European values. We can do this better together rather than each of us on his or her own. Finally, we hear voices wondering why we don't go faster and further, and may, some would say more ambitious. We did access, assess the option of introducing a cost report, minimum binding interoperability requirements for public sector bodies. We believe that this would have been too far reaching at this stage. In a constantly changing technological and legal environment, it's important not to bind ourselves in rigid solutions. We need to build in flexibility to be able to adjust to change from processes to organizations to information systems and core technologies. So instead of relying on a single approach, we aim to recognize multiple ways of ensuring interoperability of various systems. We need to agree on a set of specifications and principles to ensure that our digital public services, building blocks, fit well together. This is a constant process, not a one-off. The main road to achieve that is uh, cooperation and building trust, which is uh, at the heart of the Interoperable Europe Act. Interoperability cannot be achieved from the top down by a single entity, nor can it be achieved from the bottom up by individual actors. It requires stable, regular, and trusted cooperation between policymakers and policy implementers across all levels of government and sectors. 
This is what this regulation aims to achieve, and may I conclude by saying it's another proof for the um, truth and relevance of our slogan, we are united in diversity. It's about us uh, to, 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 to lift it at the next level by implementing much more interoperable services in the interest of our people and uh, companies and businesses. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Commissioner. It's true we need to achieve to build uh, trust uh, and cooperation. And of course, uh, uh, this is uh, one of the main reasons for interoperable Europe Act. And we have to respond to the uh, challenges and the uh, uh, very good initiatives that we take, but to implement it as well as possible. Thank you for your presentation, for your uh, statement. I go now to the interventions on behalf of political groups and on behalf of EPP, we have the coordinator, Mr. Christian Niller, and I kindly invite him to take the floor. Thank you. Welcome, Commissioner, to this committee. I think that it's not just the number of appearances in the Parliament, it's also the complexity of the questions and the battle cry for more money, which uh, creates uh, you some challenges. I would like to combine um, the structured dialogue with you on the issue, but also then on, in consequence in the general challenges by the budget. Um, coming from the from the issue we, which you rightly had been describing as a shared issue between the institutions, the Commission had been doing a conference indoors in March of this year, re inviting the relevant stakeholders and so. On. And what out of one of the obvious outcoming of that was, I mean, the question of staff on the member states level, the ability to do so. But it is not that we would be in a state that data integration or the interoperability would be simply just a matter of willingness or organization. It became clear that we are talking about an amount of data unpreceded so far. And the challenges are related to semantic interoperability, uh, to the link to artificial intelligence, so how to manage that because with the present um, um, the solutions which are coming usually from industry, you can't manage the amount of data you're exchanging between public services of 27 member states. So in the end, and that brings me a little bit like in the biology class where you had been asked on the mouse and you're not learned the mouse, so you say the mouse is gray, but you know something about the elephant and then you come to the elephant. I come to the general budget. I mean, we are, if you're looking what is really available on that? Because we all know in order to guide and to, to describe planks for that, there's heavy investment in innovation and even research needed in order to really guide us in that future. It's not given technology, it's given data, but the technology available is um, in question. So my question, if you look, as always, when we have a new program, a new idea from the Commission, I mean, how are we going to finance that? I mean, just the aspect of innovation investment needed in that area. Um, if you look to the specifically uh, the heading one of the MFS, which covers the future and competitiveness oriented programs like Horizon, I mean, the heading A is completely oversubscribed. For 24, the heading has a budget of roughly 21 billion. And we have only nine millions in the margin. I mean, I'm here for 20 years in the, in the parliament. I mean, you have been challenged that now for a long time. But 0.04% margin, I mean, that is not responsible budgeting. I'm not accusing you, but I mean, I'm just describing the realities when we look to ambitions like that and then the challenges to finance that. Uh, and specifically, it comes to innovation. So my question is, as it is with that proposal, or more general with the Fit for 55 proposal. We had been just recently um, in STOA, the, the outreach instrument of the parliament, the think tank. We learned that 25% of the technologies which we might need to achieve the 2030 goals are not available yet. So that means we really have to push innovation, to push research in order to funnel also ambitions as we had been describing that more in particular on interoperability, but in more general terms in politics like the Fit for Five regulation. So my, my question is, I mean, how are we going to do that? I mean, we, 
we had a, we have an agreement on on the Chips Act, uh, where we have now to cut cybersecurity and and other parts, um, where we have a trade off between um, a Chips Act and 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 cybersecurity. I mean, in on on chips architecture, that's pretty much related to each other. Um, so my question is, how we are going to do? What is what is for example? With the highly anticipated sovereignty fund, where which we are talking about, and I just want to highlight why it's so important. We are looking always to the public sector. You could rightly say, I mean, there should be also ambition from the industry. But today we learned that Fisman had been selling their heat pumps for 11 billions to the Americans, with the argumentation, or part of the argumentation was the investment, the technology investment needed to compete in perspective with that market with Asian investors is so high that a mid-sized company in Europe might not be able to do so without um, American partners. So that shows that, yes, we shouldn't just look in terms of innovation financing to the public sector, but also the private sector is under, under threat. So my question in general terms is, yes, we hear the ambition, we hear yet another ambition, but what are we going to do with Heading 1 if that is permanently formulated related to ambitions like that, but it's so dramatically underfunded? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. On behalf of S&D Group, uh, we have Mrs. Kutajar. She's uh, the shadow for the legislation for the Interoperable Europe Act. Mrs. Thank Kutajar. you, Commissioner, for being with us here today. Indeed, <laughs> the budget is a very important element to make sure that our aims and targets and obligations that we are introducing in several legislation, whether it's related to digitalization or the Fit for 55, will translate into effective policy and actions without leaving no one behind. And uh, I wanted, yes, to uh, highlight the, the aim of this, this act that bringing these but bringing public services closer to our citizens something which you refer to also improving the relationship with the local administrations which is a important and also a principle of good governance however i'd like to focus on today a, a bit more the mandate uh, to create more connectivity and a more inclusive uh, administration and also more inclusive public services and when I refer to connectivity, I first of all refer to the interoperable agenda, addressing the barriers um, that the less, the less advantaged face due to the lack of digital infrastructure or due to other isolating factors that disproportionately affect rural areas, peripheral regions and islands. At the same time, connectivity and interoperability have the potential to act as an inclusive factor and to ensure that public administration services are seamless to everyone, including persons with disability, with motor issues or the elderly, to whom we need to see how to include and make these facilities even more accessible. And therefore, my question is, what financial resources does the Commission additionally plan to dedicate to addressing these issues effectively in the context of interoperability and how should we incentivize research and innovation to ensure that better interoperable solutions are further explored. Obviously, it's important that uh, this act will also represent important opportunities for startups, companies, and we need to see how to include our SMEs, but we need to definitely help them with navigating through the rules, through the different uh, financing schemes, which might seem a bit uh, difficult for them at times. Also, interoperability will represent a real transition for our public sector workers who need not only the skills to operate with new solutions, not only the, the technical ones, but the legal ones, as you mentioned, but also the knowledge associated with interoperable solutions. A responsible transition definitely requires educational programs and capacity building for workers of the public sector across the board, not only those um, relating to interoperability directly. And therefore, my last question in this regard, uh, what specific training facilities and funding instruments does the Commission envisage in this sense? Thank you. Thank you very much, Josian. Uh, on behalf of the Renew, the Rapporteur for uh, uh, Interoperable Europe Act, Mr. Ijabs. 
Yes, thank you very much, Chair. And thank you, Commissioner, for being with us. Uh, well, uh, first of all, I really agree with what you said at the very beginning, that there are very clearly visible need for this uh, initiative to strengthen the European interoperability framework uh, because, uh, well, this is really intended to help our citizens and uh, local communities, especially in the, in the context of inclusion. Uh, and I think that the approach that has been chosen uh, by the Commission, that this is not a top-down uh, legislation which would centralize all the possible digital systems in the EU, which most probably wouldn't be possible, uh, but rather providing an enabling framework uh, which would help the member states and the public sector bodies uh, to move into the direction of interoperability. I think that this approach is, is completely justified, and, and that's why I think that I... I will do uh, all my best uh, to complete this legislation uh, in this parliamentary mandate in order to get it done, because this is really an important file. Nevertheless, I have three uh, questions regarding uh, the very content of the Commission's proposal. First of all, there is this concept which was introduced in the communication uh, at the very beginning, the interoperability by design which uh, would, uh, well, include that also all the European legislation and policies are from the beginning on already tested uh, towards certain criteria of interoperability. I actually don't see much of it in the text of the report itself, and, and in that sense I would, I would uh, be happy uh, to hear whether you have any uh, ideas how to strengthen this approach, uh, because, well, it's very important in this field to, to, to make something interoperable from the very start. It's much more easy than to, to amend and to regulate uh, the already existing systems. Uh, second uh, thing is that we all know that many of the digital systems are being uh, uh, introduced by means of the EU funds. Uh, well, the question would be whether there are any uh, possibilities to at least to strengthen the criteria, at least for those systems that are being introduced, either by the RRF or by structural funds, which would probably, well, help a little bit more to move into that direction of what imperability of a public sector board is. And the third question is, uh, well, a question I don't know any answer myself, uh, even despite the fact that this is a really a crucial topic right now. This is about the sandboxes. Uh, well, uh, regarding, we all know that there is also a part of sandboxing in the AI Act, which is upcoming. Well, the question is whether you see any, well, uh, possibilities to align uh, the work on interoperability with other initiatives regarding sandboxes, because most probably that would be uh, very useful to streamline the European approach to this uh, issue. But uh, thank you very much for all your proposals, and uh, thank you for the European Commission for this initiative. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ijabs. On behalf of ECR, uh, Mr. Ilcic, please. Thank you, Chair. I will speak Croatian. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Mr. Commissioner. I am very glad to hear that you are intending to reduce bureaucracy and administrative work. I hope that these measures will stimulate member states to better interoperability within their borders. For example, in Croatia, not even our state services and institutions are connected between themselves. So if you want to get a hold of a document in one state institution, they send you along on a chase to other institutions to get other documents from them and return to their offices, and then only can you obtain what you wished. On the other hand, we have this intention of investing 130 million euros in, during the upcoming four years, so a huge sum for reducing administration, while at the same time in some other files 
for example, the directive on energy efficiency of uh, buildings, this administration is once more being multiplied, enhanced. Energy certificates are being asked, then we have global warming potential certificates, passports for renovations, and so on and so forth. So I'm not completely clear on the final direction. Do we wish to decrease or increase the administrative duties? My question is more related to the budget. When I've mentioned uh, renovation of buildings, practically no one within the parliament or within the EU isn't happy with the f speed of the renovation nor the results. Uh, personally, I believe that uh, this um, is quite logical because if you have a family that installed a gas boiler four or five years ago, it is difficult to motivate them to again get rid of this and get a heat pump or perhaps solar panels as well, because then they will not be very interested in this possibility. And at the same time, we have people building new houses and they cannot get the subventions uh, to construct above the required standards. I believe that efficiency could be greatly improved there because these people have a personal motivation during construction to get the best possible solution and not have to redo later on to change, renovate. So my question would be, do you plan within the budget for 2024 have subventions for smart solutions at the time of new construction. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ilčić. As do no, we do not have any other uh, intervention or question, uh, I go back to Commissioner and kindly invite him to answer, uh, to react to these uh, suggestions and answer to the questions. Please, Commissioner. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, I fully understand that you attempted uh, also to address the Budget Commissioner uh, <laughs> uh, having him there, but the reason is um, I, I'm in charge of all central services and IT is one of it and uh, of course our ad also administration and the exchange with other public administration is, so to say, part of my responsibilities and this has triggered, so to say, the initiative on our side. If I may say, um, second, simply to recall, uh, I remember some of you, like uh, you, Mr. Ehler, have been present in the uh, debate last week in Strasbourg on the uh, budget guidelines for the uh, next budget, and uh, we are discussing uh, quasi in parallel. We will make a proposal on the MFF review, um, but I would like to recall the limitations of the European budget and, uh, so to say, the intention of it. First, I uh, understand there is a, a, a misleading, not a wrong, a misleading perception uh, having in mind the figures, but one should always keep in mind we are talking about the seven years budget. So if you uh, break it down or divide it by seven, it becomes much more... Um, um, humble and in reality it's around 1% of the European GDP compared to to much bigger budgets of national um, uh, uh, of member states. Having said this, nevertheless, as thanks not God but thanks all of us, already um, almost 93% of the budget are reallocated to activities, to programs, to activities, etc mainly inside Europe, but also outside Europe, only less than 7% are there for overhead costs. It's nevertheless um, a small portion of what is needed in all policy areas. And this is why, so to say, the main philosophy or the main intention of the, of the budget is to, to, to launch something, to pursue Europe-wide uh, political priorities to have a kind of seed financing, but at the end of the day, it has to be uh, matched by public and private activities. And this is why, uh, so to say, whatever we propose cannot be financed only by the European budget. And this is why I have highlighted to the fact that uh, 
only within next generation EU, uh, around 47 billions have been dedicated to investments into digitalization. Of course, this depends from member state to member states. It's also partly hardware, not only software. It's also partly uh, training. It's, it's a mixture of each and everything. And honestly, I'm not aware, but as a former uh, commissioner for, for the structural funds, uh, I know already at that time we budgetized a significant amount of money for investments in the digitalization of our member states, of our regions, and the same was with the ESF. Uh, I think looking to a colleague from, I think, Lithuania, uh, we, we won. Pardon? Latvia. Latvia, sorry. But I think I'm referring now to a project in Lithuania. It, it, was, um, it was about um, uh, training elderly people to use um, uh, the web. Uh, in particular in remote areas. And uh, this project was awarded uh, by, by um, receiving a regional um, uh, fund prize or whatsoever. So I think we are not starting from the scratch, but what we have seen is that uh, the, the, the cross-border activities of people, not to speak about companies, have significantly increased. And what we try to achieve with this Interoperability Act is to support these uh, cross-border activities of our people. And this is why we, we have launched this initiative, and it can't be an initiative which a priori is covering each and every um, areas of our daily life. The idea of this act, and but that's why it should become a quasi legally binding uh, um, initiative is that in the future lawmakers are forced once they produce something new to see to which extent an interoperable element has to be introduced in case it is necessary. And here I'm talking primarily about cross-border um, initiative, but I know that in big countries uh, uh, even between regions, there is not really an operability. I think in, in Germany, the, the uh, electronic health card uh, is not yet interoperable amongst regions, uh, which I think is, is an issue. And this is why, rightly so, Germany has now um, um, allocated several billions within uh, um, the RRP for digitalization of the public administration. Uh, and, and this is exactly the intention of this Interoperability Act, uh, to force, to push, to promote the, the, this element of interoperability across borders in many different areas. I give you a very personal example. Last year, I had the great pleasure to be once again married. And I had to go with my future and now wife to the, to the, to the service uh, where we had to register for the marriage. And um, unfortunately in Austria, the, the, the civil servant there was, had already all the necessary papers we, uh, we, we should have. We were not forced to bring anything with us. And it was not only this, uh, my wife, uh, decided to add to her name my name. So that means many of her documents, starting with the driving license, the passport, had to be uh, renewed. And even this was offered by the public administration uh, within a couple of days after the marriage. Uh, we didn't have to do anything. So this was and is possible only within the country. If I would have married somebody being not an Austrian citizen, she would have been forced to go with the document physically to their, uh, I don't know, public administrations uh, to get issued a passport, a new one, a new driving license, you name it. And what we would like to achieve is that this service, which is already today inside the country, is possible, 
should also be possible across the border because it reflects more and more the behavior of us, the Europeans. We are so much interconnected, also in our daily life, that this has to be reflected um, um, also in the way we are doing this. Having said this, leads me again to the money. I think it's important to understand whatever we launching here should be seen and understood as an investment and not as uh, expenditures, as costs. Of course, at the beginning, there are costs. But at the end, it pays off much more than it uh, would have uh, or will have costed uh, beforehand because it reduces uh, the burden, the time, the nerves, whatever you like, uh, and uh, it will also reassure, uh, let's say, the acceptance of state authorities by people. We have seen just in the past couple of years uh, that uh, many people, because of pandemia, now the energy surge, energy uh, cost surge and so on, have lost trust in public administrations. And if we can regain, and I believe this is an element where we can regain trust by our people, by offering services, by offering them, uh, uh, so say, good, um, good services, which uh, helps them to save time, to save money, is something which they finally will certainly acknowledge. And for this, I really want to ask you as, as representatives, as elected representatives, um, to, to be an advocate back home. I mean, those who are sitting here are already uh, doing this, but many others have to do it because we have received first reactions by some member states saying this initiative is violating the principle of subsidiarity, is intervening in the sovereignty of member states, etc. Honestly, this is ridiculous. This is ridiculous. Nobody is challenging the, the responsibility of member states, of regions, their legal, so to say, uh, 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 um, responsibilities and, and, and remits. But what we are going for is enabling, uh, so to say, the exchange of uh, data across borders. Uh, and in particular, if there are different um, regulations in place, it should help to overcome this and, and, and to serve people. So I really would like to, to ask you to, to reach out also to your colleagues, but also back home, telling them this is not a further attempt to further centralize anything and to have a further surveillance. It's simply an act to improve the service quality of our daily life in the interest for our citizens. That's why I think it's, it's extremely important uh, to do this. And uh, um, um, according to uh, some questions, I think uh, concerning the, this uh, question of, uh, how did you say, um, interoperability by design, uh, it's something where uh, we have to link uh, to the impact assessment and on the basis of this, I think we can make uh, further and more concrete uh, proposals. Uh, the other thing is uh, um, concerning the sandboxes, uh, there is a fair point and we will try to align it with the AI, uh, um, AI Act uh, in order not to have too many uh, different, um, uh, let's say, assessment and approaches and to keep it as simple as uh, possible. But once again, I'm grateful for your support on, on it. We have... Do you allow a question yeah, from Steeler? Uh, um, uh, we have a very um, limited budget dedicated to this, but at the end of the day, uh, there are many different sources also um, from the European level, but more important from the private and public sector in member states. So this is a joint effort. This is an effort which is not a one-off activity, but it's a rollout of a principle of an idea um, 
across all the member states and it has to be applied step by step whenever a new legislation comes into force or an existing one has to be, for whatever reasons, uh, modified. Thank you, Commissioner. Just a short intervention from Mr. Yiller and uh... I think our role is not just to ask problematic questions, but I would like you to be aware. Um, the Commission itself made an endorsed conference, which is about interoperability of data. That's really the background of, of that exercise. I mean, if it's just between two institutions exchanging data, it's relatively simple. But if at the very moment, as you have been referring to, to uh, for example, health data, I mean, we, it, it, it took us a miracle, and it was against the law, that in Stuttgart, the supercomputer center did the simulation of the pandemia of COVID in Europe. It was against the law. Um, we, we didn't have proper data because we didn't have data from every member state and so on. And I just would like you to be aware that we are not running yet again in, 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 a, in, in conflicts about the budget. If the dimension described in the proposal of the Commission should be reached, then you need investment in research and innovation, not just because um, it's always good to do that, I mean, the ambition formulated, the technology is partly not there. And the beauty and the sense of European research is that, if you're honest, the research program is also a market development program, and it's also a program how to develop the framework um, conditions for interoperability. Because if you don't have a common standard, you agree on basically by research, for example, on machine reading, you have semantic problems you can't solve. And I'm just telling, and, and we would also offer, if it would be upfront, that we say, okay, it's not always new money which is the solution, but then it's a reprioritization of money within existing programs. But we should be aware, if you want to have that ambition, you have to heavily invest. And it makes sense that Europe is invest, because otherwise we don't have standardization. And I think it would be wise not just to run this file and then, like with the CHIPS Act, coming up with the financial question in the end, and then we are cannibalizing. We still have two or three programs where we have working programs we can adopt, we can prioritize, but it's much more difficult than to do that as with the CHIPS Act. In the final negotiations on a, on a, on a political ambition where we agreed on that simply as parliament and institutions, because otherwise we would have looked like idiots. And that is really a very complex proposal where we should upfront also be honest about the level of investment we need and perhaps about reprioritization instead of announcing and then starting to sort out somehow where we get the money from and getting in, in political and budget conflicts. And I think that is something we would like to urge you because you have this double function of budget commissioner and you're in charge of that to realize because you had been documented that by your own conference in March. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Taylor. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you once again. Um, uh, of course, we and I will take this into not consideration, but um, really to look into it. Um, and you are right, there are already different existing programs. Uh, you were referring in your first intervention on the Sovereignty Fund. But the idea we are following here is because when this idea was uh, raised first time, I think it was President Macron, and then it was sort of taken over by our president, um, everybody was asking, it's about what? And uh, the, the answer was, it, it, it should be something which is uh, enabling uh, quickly uh, the launch of certain uh, industries, of certain uh, areas which we prioritize, clean tech, quantum computing, etc., you name it. But, um, I mean, we will present it in the course of the MFF review, but uh, the, I can tell you already today, the thinking goes into the direction to, uh, to reinforce existing programs, which are already there, where we have uh, um, 
a set of rules, we have a governance structure, and uh, if we quasi um, ring fence a certain amount for this and that, uh, then we, we are much faster in the implementing. We both have experienced the, the painful setup of the ESC. Now we have it. Uh, it's no reason to, 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 to create something new which is similar. The better is uh, to invest in, into this existing one uh, to help creating some additional initiatives. And uh, of course, it can be labeled under the general headline sovereignty fund, which means creating more uh, sovereignty, uh, um, autonomy, whatever, however you call it, uh, as a European Union, but the aim is simply uh, to push uh, certain uh, um, uh, investments we consider as important, as relevant, uh, as fast as possible. And for this, I think it's better to focus on something which already exists, uh, where we have experience how it is applied and uh, reinforcing it wherever we consider it uh, relevant and not reinventing the wheel. Ah, I just learned that uh, we will uh, work with the ESCOs in the public sector. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Thank you, colleagues, for the interesting questions and for engaging uh, in this dialogue. Of course, uh, as we just uh, uh, discussed previously, looking to the draft report of Mr. Ijabs, we will continue to work. We'd like to finish this uh, in uh, July in the committee. We have a uh, until the next week, uh, the deadline for amendments. But this is just part of uh, a bigger work uh, to make uh, uh, our institutions working better, more transparent, uh, more efficient, with the help of the new technologies and uh, building, as the Commissioner said, uh, solidarity and cooperation at the EU level. Thank you, colleagues. If there is now any other business, then tomorrow we have the joint uh, MV committee to vote on methane uh, emissions, and our next committee is 22-23 of May. Thank you to the Secretariat, to the interpreters, and to the technical services of European Parliament. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you, Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Oh,